welcome to the Clockworks Academy class on the 1941 film The Wolfman. This is both a standalone class on this film and it is also a bonus ninth class in the eight week course on werewolves. That course has been focused on medieval werewolves, but for this class I'm talking about a 20th century werewolf as a bonus. You can find that eight-week class and all the classes that I do at clockworksacademy.com. That's where you'll find and be able to register for the eight-week werewolves course, a course, an eight-week course on zombies in film, comics, and prose, a course on Frankenstein, a course on Beowulf, a course on Dracula, a course on Robin Hood in medieval ballads all the way up to 21st century movies, a course on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, and a course on the Decameron, and depending on when you're listening to this, possibly even more. These are the courses available at Clockworks Academy as of the time of this recording. Clockworks Academy is an online school. You can find it at clockworksacademy.com. We have online courses in all kinds of things. This class today, though, as I said, is a bonus extra that's available for everyone that no one needs to register for, and I hope that you enjoy it. I am Dr. Paul Moffat, the founder of Clockworks Academy. That is me. Look, that's a doctor hat. That's how you can tell I'm a doctor. They only let doctors wear that kind of hat, and it's the only kind of hat I wear. I have a PhD in English literature specializing in late medieval Arthurian romance with additional specializations in literary theory, adaptations, and popular culture. I'll spend a little bit of time at the top of this class talking about adaptation theory as it applies to the Wolfman and in general. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about monsters in general, although not very long because I've covered that often in other videos and we'll spend most of this class talking about the 1941 film, The Wolfman. So let's talk about adaptation. In general terms, adaptation is any time we take one text and turn it into another text. We most commonly use it in film studies to talk about turning a novel into a film, but that's only really a subset of what ad adaptation is. Of course, you can turn a novel into a video game, you can turn a video game into a film, you can turn a theme park into a film, you can turn one movie into another or one novel into another, and all of that qualifies as adaptation. It really is just any time you take one text and turn it into another. And in theoretical terms, I'm very interested in how that works and why it works. If you'd like to know more about adaptation theory from me, you can check out the other videos that I have done on adaptations of monster stories into films. Those links will be popping up right now. I try in each of these classes to focus just for a moment on a different aspect of adaptation theory, and what I want to focus on today for a discussion of The Wolfman, which is not a direct adaptation of any particular text, I want to talk about the idea of a palimpsest. Now, palimpsests are applied specifically to adaptation theory by theorist Gerard Genette. This is him. In his book, Palimpsest Literature in the Second Degree. Now, Genette's book uh, is fascinating, and if you're interested in adaptation theory, extremely useful. He doesn't actually uh, fixate on on the word palimpsest all that much in his book Palimpsests, but I'm going to today. I bring him up because uh, he's the one who really, especially for me, connected the idea of palimpsests to adaptation theory, but in his book Palimpsest Literature in the Second Degree, Jeanette mostly is doing a taxonomy of different kinds of adaptations in different modes and uh, suggesting names for different kinds, and he it's uh, 
frankly a lot of fun and a lot and very interesting, but not really fixating on palimpsests that much, which I want to sit fixate on palimpsests. A palimpsest is comes to us in English from Greek palimpsestos, which means scraped again. And the idea of a palimpsest is when you are writing on vellum, vellum is what was used before paper was uh, widely in use in Europe, uh, you write, uh, uh, vellum is an animal skin, and it is valuable, and it is too valuable to write on it and then just throw it away when you're done. So often what was done, if we wanted to reuse a piece of vellum, either because there was a mistake or just because we need a new text and the old one uh, is deemed less valuable than this imagined new one, is you scrape off the top layer of the vellum to make it clean. Just like erasing with paper, but... Uh, I mean, a little more involved and a little more difficult because the vellum is thick and you literally scrape it with a knife to scrape off what was there before. And it's scraped again because that's the way you prepare vellum in the first place. You take the animal skin, you scrape it flat and clean so that it is smooth enough to write on. And then if it has, if you want to reuse it, you scrape it again removing the top layer and making it once again smooth and clean enough to write on. We can see an example of this. This is a 9th century text. Uh, the top writing there in black and red is by Severus of Antioch. And you can tell if you turn the um, vellum sheet 90 degrees, you can tell that uh, there was something else written on it before. What's written there before is... From, is in Greek, from the Gospel of Luke and from the Iliad. I can't read it well enough in this image to be able to tell what this particular page is. But the whole text is... Uh, the Greek writing is from the Gospel of Luke and from the Iliad, and it is from about the 6th century. It's been scraped clean, and then new writing has been put on top. And the idea of a palimpsest, as you can see it here, is that this scraping clean doesn't erase what was written entirely. What was there first bleeds up or appears as a shadow, and so you have two texts right on top of each other. Thomas de Quincey, an English essayist, there's a picture of him, said that the human brain is a palimpsest. What else than a natural and mighty palimpsest is the human brain? Such a palimpsest is my brain, such a palimpsest, O oh reader, is yours. Everlasting layers of ideas, images, feelings have fallen upon your brain softly as light. Each succession has seemed to bury all that went before, and yet in reality not one has been extinguished. And the idea that De Quincey has is that, like a palimpsest, things that appear to have been forgotten, things that appear to have been erased, are just buried and the idea of erasure as creating layers instead of wiping things away is central to the idea of a palimpsest. Freud picks up on the same idea, and that's basically how his idea of how memory works is things that are lost in your memory aren't lost, they're just buried. And the memory works as a palimpsest. The image that Freud gives of how memory works is what he calls the uh, mystic writing pad. This was marketed in the... We see a commercial here from the 60s as a magic slate. First, we'll lift the pages of the magic slate, and presto, the writing disappears. Like magic! And we're ready again. We had them when I was a kid. I don't really remember having them for my kids. But the idea of a mystic writing pad or a magic slate is you write on the, uh, like, celluloid, the, the top layer, and it sticks to, like, a wax on the bottom layer. And it's the contact between the two layers that creates the impression. And Freud suggested that that's literally how memory works. It's the contact creates the memory, and that when the contact is broken, 
There's still an impression on the wax. There's still a part of the mind that remembers, but your conscious mind only can only... You're only conscious of the memories when your conscious mind, the, the top layer of the writing, writing pad, is making contact with the deeper memory, which is the wax part of the writing pad. And this is important for the idea of a palimpsest because, again, we pull up the top layer and it seems to be erased, but it's not erased. And if you've ever played with one of these magic slates, you know that there's still an indent, there's still a trace of everything that has happened before. And it's not the same thing as a palimpsest, because it's not exactly the same thing, but it's a similar idea that everything that's ever been written is there as a trace, and you can see evidence of it, and you can find evidence of it, even if the top layer doesn't seem to be connected to this bottom layer at all anymore. The point here is that connections between texts can be and often are present as traces. Sometimes unacknowledged, sometimes unrecognized, sometimes even unintentional. Yet they're still present. When we are reading, when we are looking at The Wolfman 1941, which does not seem to have any direct adaptation, any direct source, when we recognize that the Wolfman is not a direct or deliberate adaptation of any one text, unlike Dracula, unlike Frankenstein, that does not mean that it's not an adaptation. Like Frankenstein or Dracula, the Wolfman is still an adaptation because it is still taking what has come before it and turning it into a new text. And when we are paying attention to the Wolfman, we should keep our eyes open for traces. And because this is week nine of an eight-week course on medieval werewolves, I'm going to occasionally point out the traces of medieval werewolf stories here in the 1941 Wolfman. Let's shift gears and talk quickly for a moment about monsters. As I said, I have done a little dip into monster theory at the beginning of each of these public uh, classes, and I usually do one at the beginning of each of my classes, uh, my eight-week classes. So in the interest of not being too repetitive, I'm going to go quite quickly over the fact that monstrare comes from Latin to show, which means monsters demonstrate something. And what they show us is the fears, desires, and boundaries of both a particular time and place, a particular society out of which they are written and into which they are written, and also they give us some hints into the universal fears and desires and boundaries that we draw for ourselves as human beings, as part of the human condition. And if you'd like to hear more in depth about all of that that I just kind of glazed over, any one of my previous videos will give you a little more depth. But I want to look at, for today, specifically at a little bit from uh, this book, Classic Readings on Monster Theory, uh, edited by Asa Simon Mittman and Marcus Hensel. This is an anthology of writings on monster theory, and if you're interested in monster theory, I recommend it. But in the introduction, Mittman and Hensel say that inside every monster lurks a human being. Peel back the fur, the scales, the spikes, the slime, and beneath the monstrous hide, there we are, always and inevitably. And that's the part of monster theory I really want to emphasize and remind us of for this class on the 1941 Wolfman movie. Monsters are made by humans, not just in the sense that Frankenstein's monster is made by humans within the story, although that too, but also that what we consider monstrous is a human construct, and that sense that monsters are made by and out of humans shows up in monster stories again and again and again and again, as it does in The Wolfman. Monsters are made by humans for humans, because monsters and monstrosity is defined by humans as a contrast that helps us understand and define what we mean by human in the first place. <laughs> 
which is just to say that monsters are humans. And by reading monster stories and understanding how we perceive and conceive of monsters, we understand something about how we perceive and conceive of humanity itself. This doesn't is a distinct from them. This shows up sometimes in movies, not, I think, in The Wolfman, except maybe very faintly. But it shows up sometimes in movies as the idea that humans are the real monsters. But for today, I want to kind of flip that and <laughs> emphasize that it's not that humans are the real monsters. It's that monsters are the real humans. Let's take a closer look at the Wolfman. I'd like to start thinking about the Wolfman by thinking about the idea of tragedy. According to the DVD commentary by Tom Weaver, who is a film historian, and the DVD commentary I recommend, it is full of interesting anecdotes and facts about the production of this movie. I couldn't verify this, I couldn't find the interview that he was referring to, but Tom Weaver quotes the director of this movie, George Wagner, as saying that all his horror movies needed to have be tragic and inevitable. And tragic has lots of meanings, but when Wagner connects tragic and inevitable, I suspect that he is thinking about Greek tragedy, and particularly the kind of Greek tragedy like Oedipus Rex, where, uh, where there's a sense of inevitability, where the plot, I mean, the, the tragic inevitability of Oedipus Rex is that the prophecy that, uh, the characters try to avoid, they bring it about by trying to avoid it, and everything just comes exactly to where they're trying to avoid it getting, right? Um, so Oedipus Rex hears a prophecy that he's going to murder his father and sleep with his mother so they and, and marry his mother, so they send him away from them, and as a result, he doesn't know his father and mother and can't avoid the prophecy. There's a sense of inevitability in the Wolfman, a sense of inevitability where it's quite early in the movie that we can see what is going to happen. Uh, there are not a lot of twisty surprises, uh, cliffhanger reveals in this movie. Rather, I mean, the title of the movie is The Wolfman. They give away, there's no spoilers possible in this movie. They give away in the trailer that Lon Chaney is the Wolfman. They give away in the first couple of seconds that Lon Chaney Jr. is going to be the Wolfman. And then there's things like, for example, when Lon Chaney goes and buys a walking stick and we hear that only a silver weapon can kill a werewolf. A werewolf can be killed only with a silver bullet or a silver knife or a stick with a silver handle. Lon Chaney buys a walking stick with a silver handle. This is only wood and silver. He gives that same walking okay. stick to his father. Please, just take it with you, please. And his father then uses the same walking stick to kill the Wolfman, Lon Chaney, uh, Larry Talbot, played by Lon Chaney, who gave his father the walking stick. There's a sense of tragic irony and inevitability there. The movie's full of these mirror scenes, like Larry comes to the castle because his older brother has been killed in a hunting accident. Your brother's death was a blow to all of us. And Sir John starts the movie welcoming a son. And if we have any sense of tragic irony, we already can predict how the movie's going to end, and it we are correct. It ends with Larry dying in a hunting accident, and Sir John saying uh, goodbye to the son that he begins the movie welcoming. So there's another sense of mirroring. And perhaps the most one of the most profound elements of tragic inevitability in this movie is the inclusion of the pentagram. The pentagram that 
is the sign of the werewolf, and we'll talk more about that in just one second, but particularly the way that the pentagram appears on the palm of the werewolf's next victim. That is, those of you who've taken my werewolves course will know, that is not an element of uh, medieval werewolf fiction. It's not an element of any werewolf story, as far as I am aware. Uh, but it gives this movie a sense of tragic inevitability, where knowing the future doesn't stop it from happening. Knowing who the werewolf's next victim is going to be doesn't keep that victim safe. And we see that playing out with Bela, the, played by Bela Lugosi, Bela the werewolf who sees the pentagram on Jenny's palm, sends her away, closes down, does everything that he can think of to try to keep from attacking her. But all those things are uh, unsuccessful because the sign of a pentagram on the hand is the werewolf's next victim. And there's a sense in tragedy and there's a sense in the wolfman of the future being already set of the whether that's because the future is whether that's because the future is set or whether that's because the line of causality is set i mean we could talk the philosophy of that and that's not so much important but it's the same kind of sense as once you're bitten by a werewolf you become a werewolf why because one thing follows another because your actions can't prevent the unfolding of fate, the unfolding of destiny, the unfolding of cause and effect. It doesn't really matter how you frame it. There's a sense of tragic inevitability that permeates this whole movie and is a big part of why the movie is has a sense of uh, pathos that is sometimes missing in these Universal Monster movies. There's a sense of pathos, I mean, we could compare it to, and I don't want to spend too much time comparing it to other movies, but, like, there's a different sense of pathos in Frankenstein where nothing seems inevitable, where the... Effect, the what happens in Frankenstein is only inevitable because human nature makes it that, but what happens in The Wolfman is inevitable beyond the control of human nature. And there's a sense of the main character's helplessness, that they're caught up in this plot that's just moving forward without them. And that reflects how Larry feels through the whole movie, that things, wheels are in motion that he doesn't have control over. And he spends so much of the movie kind of looking baffled and trying futilely to get some kind of grounding, to get some kind of control over his fate, over his destiny. And as it happens, an early title for this movie, which would have been a terrible title for the movie, and I don't think it was ever intended as an actual title, it was just the working title. But the working title of this movie was Destiny. Because there's a sense of destiny permeating the whole of the movie. Coming back to the pentagram, though, there's a real question, too. Why a pentagram? Pentagram is... The pentagram is not particularly associated with werewolves before this movie. The association of werewolves and pentagrams or pentacles, and I'm going to kind of use it interchangeably, and I know there is a difference. A pentacle is a pentagram encircled by a circle. What appears on the werewolf's hand is a pentacle, not a pentagram. And the scar on his chest and the bite scars are pentacles. The movie uses them interchangeably. I'm going to basically use them interchangeably too. Um, but pentagrams are not particularly associated with werewolves before this movie and after this movie they are. So the question is, why a pentagram? And there are lots of possible reasons. I do want to talk about pentagrams. I maybe am sounding a little bit uh, uh, blasé about it because I recognize a person could spend hours exploring pentagrams and their symbolic meanings, and I just am not going to. So I'm going to give a bit of a uh, cursory look 
But pentagrams are associated with balance, symbolically. When a pentagram, this is are all things that you maybe have heard before, when a pentagram is uh, depicted with the one point up and the two points down, it symbolizes balance, it symbolizes, and you can kind of imagine, uh, I don't know if this is why it symbolizes balance, but we can kind of imagine the two legs are easy to stand on, and it's the shape of a human with arms outstretched, and it symbolizes humanity and balance and proportion, and it is associated with all of those things, balance and virtue and proportion, when the pentagram is upside down and the two points are up and the one point is down, then it symbolizes things that are out of balance. And listen, I'm aware that there is a longer, more in-depth, more complex, more nuanced history of the symbolic meaning and implications of a pentagram than I'm giving here. Um, I am suppose what I'm mostly trying to get at for my purposes is not everything a pentagram could mean ever, but why the filmmakers chose a pentagram specifically in this movie. So, the two things I think that associate a pentagram with werewolves very interestingly are pentagrams are associated with witchcraft as both specifically as a chosen symbol of Wicca, the religion, but also superstitiously as a symbol of anything occult or uh, magic or uh, kind of vaguely witchcraft in the most general and and non-specific way. And that association, I think, is what we're particularly playing on with the pentagram associated with the werewolf, as it's a connection of werewolfism to all kinds of magic, occult, witchcraft in the broadest sense, broadest and vaguest sense. Those of you who've done the werewolf course with me will know, in medieval werewolf stories, werewolves are usually... A person usually becomes a werewolf because of some kind of magic. And sometimes it is malevolent magic, and sometimes it isn't. Um, but it is, you know, magic ointments, or a magic spell, or a magic ring, or magical wolf skin. Any one of those things is drawing on a folk tradition of witchcraft. And there's an association of werewolves in the, um... Romanian tradition, there's an association of werewolves and vampires. If you took my Dracula course, I talk a little bit about that in that course. But in Dracula, the main characters find Dracula described early on as a werewolf or a vampire. And in Romanian folklore, if a werewolf dies, he comes back to life as a vampire. So the association of werewolves and vampires and shapeshifters and witchcraft is all present in this idea of the pentacle or the pentagram. Also, the dual nature of a pentagram, that when it's upright, it symbolizes balance and virtue, and when it's upside down, it symbolizes evil and imbalance. This is quite appropriate for a werewolf who also symbolizes a dual nature. So it can be one thing or it can be another. And the pentagram inscribed on Larry's hand, whether it's upright or not, depends on where you're standing and who is seeing it. The question is whether it is, if it is an upside down sign of evil or a right side up sign of balance depends on who is seeing it. Likewise, Larry the werewolf, likewise werewolves and shapeshifters in general. It's about dual identity, but also about perception, all about how it's not clear who he is until you know who's looking at him and what perspective you have. That brings us a bit to talking about the wolfman and werewolf mythology, because the pentagram is brought into werewolf mythology by this movie, 
There are a few other aspects of 20th and 21st century werewolf mythology that are either invented by this movie or greatly popularized by the Wolfman. And one of them is the idea of a werewolf bite. In the medieval werewolf stories that we read in my course, none of the werewolves are transformed by a bite from a werewolf. And even there are characters occasionally who are bitten by werewolves, and there is no anxiety that they might then become a werewolf themselves. But Larry, in this movie, is explicitly transformed into a werewolf because he is bitten by a werewolf. Oh, I'm sick of the whole thing. I'm going to get out of here. Oh, yeah, but he's bitten by a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. That actor, oh, Maria Uspenskaya, by the way, uh, is just great. I, I think she is a absolute highlight of this movie. And she'll return, she returns later, will be associated with the Wolfman, and she'll return, I think, in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman in the next uh, werewolf movie with Larry Talbot, played by Lon Chaney. She's back again. I think she's one of the major highlights of this movie. The way you walk is thorny through no fault of your own. But as the rain enters the soil, the river enters the sea, so tears run to a predestinate end. Find peace for a moment, my son. But I'm digressing, because the point is that being bitten by a werewolf means Larry becomes a werewolf. That isn't brand new for this movie. That is something taken from an earlier Universal movie, Werewolf of London, directed by Stuart Walker and released in 1935. Werewolf of London, as far as I can tell, and I have looked into it a lot, Werewolf of London is the first time that a werewolf bite is the source of transferring werewolfness or, or spreading werewolfism. And, uh, and how did these unfortunate gentlemen contract this, uh, this medieval unpleasantness? From the bite of another werewolf. And Werewolf of London was not particularly popular, was not a success. It's why Universal reboots the concept of a werewolf for the Wolfman with Lon Chaney. But Kurt Seodmak, the screenwriter of The Wolfman, was inspired by the earlier 1935 Werewolf of London for some aspects of the mythology that he puts into The Wolfman. So the idea of werewolves being spread by bite really is popularized by the 1941 Wolfman movie. Also popularized or beginning to be popularized by this movie is the idea of the association of a moon with being a werewolf. You may notice that in this movie, there are mentions of the moon. Gwen, the leading lady, the love interest, has moon, uh, half moon earrings. And there's some mentions of the moon throughout. But it's a weak association. But in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, the sequel to this movie, the moon association becomes stronger and all the rest of the Universal movies associate transforming into a werewolf with the full moon. And that really is where that association uh, comes from. In the medieval werewolf stories that we've read, Different werewolves transform in different circumstances, but usually they transform either uh, out of their will by malevolent action, usually by a woman who betrays them, or deliberately by changing their clothes. And then sometimes they can't transform back because a woman betrays them and steals their clothes. But the idea of the moon specifically being associated with werewolf transformations, this is the seed of that. The other, another aspect of werewolf mythology that has its start in the wolfman, or at least flourishes 
from the Wolfman is the association of silver and werewolves. Now, this isn't an invita- This isn't an invention of Siodbeck in uh, the script to the Wolfman. There was again a weak association of silver and werewolves before this movie, but the specific conceit that only silver can kill a werewolf. A werewolf can be killed only with a silver bullet or a silver knife or a stick with a silver handle. As far as I can tell, and again, I've looked into it as quite a bit, as far as I can tell, this is the first appearance of that idea. There is an association, a much earlier and a long-standing association of silver with... uh, protection from witchcraft in general, and uh, because silver symbolizes purity. But the idea of silver as being the one and only thing that can kill a werewolf has its origin, as far as I can tell, in this movie. The Wolfman, the 1941 Wolfman, when I was talking earlier about uh, inevitability, there is one final sense of inevitability that is not spelled out in this movie. It's an aspect of werewolf mythology that actually is not explicit in this movie, but there's a bit of uh, subtle trace of it. We might call it a palimpsest from the 1935 Werewolf of London. In Werewolf of London 1935, it, it is explicitly stated that the werewolf kills what it loves best. The werewolf instinctively seeks to kill the thing it loves best. That isn't explicitly stated in The Wolfman, but there is an implication that uh, Gwen is particularly in danger from Larry because Larry cares about her. And, uh, I mean, it is not, I think... There isn't an indication that Larry is the person that Bela the werewolf loved best, or that the gravedigger is the person that Larry loved best, but there is a sense of the inevitability and tragedy of George Wagner's movie that, of course, the werewolf will, in the end, focus on the person that he cares about the most, and that is Gwen and his father, and his father kills him because in a tragic story framework. It's not only the werewolf, it's every character kills the person that they love best. And that idea that the werewolf always kills what it loves best, and particularly not only what it loves best, but the association of uh, romantic or sexual desire with then violent, aggressive desire from the werewolf to hunt and kill, that's going to continue to show up in werewolf stories before, and we can see this is one of our traces one of our traces of medieval werewolf stories is not the idea that the werewolf kills what it loves best, but the idea that uh, werewolf violence or threat of violence is a metaphorical representation of the threat of domestic violence. So the association of love, desire, and violence, particularly in a werewolf, that is something that we are seeing here in this movie that has its that is a a trace that has its origins far back in werewolf stories and that we can see through the many medieval werewolf stories that uh, we could look at that we did look at if you took that course. The last thing I want to kind of specifically look at in the context of werewolf mythology in this movie is the werewolf poem. This poem. Um, It is, I think, common knowledge that this poem was written for this movie. Almost every source I have found says something like, "Uh, despite a lot of, or uh, despite the common misconception that this was a folklore poem, it was actually invented for this movie. And I've just seen that said so often, I doubt that it is a common misconception. I suspect that anyone who cares knows it was invented for this movie. Uh, 
But this poem was invented for this movie. And the poem that goes with werewolves that is said three times early on in this movie, Larry hears it three times in quick succession, and so does the audience, and that might be why it's so memorable. Even a man who's pure in heart and says his prayers at night can become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. I want to emphasize... I want to draw your attention to and emphasize a couple of the specific aspects of this poem and what they mean for the movie and for werewolf mythology in general. And the first is the idea of even a man who is pure in heart. The idea of purity is important in werewolf stories, and it's important in this story. And we could wonder, like, the setup suggests that Larry is pure in heart, because he is, but he becomes a werewolf and it's tragic. And if you were, I think, a lazier film writer, you would make Larry absolutely, purely virtuous in every way until he's transformed into a werewolf. But I think that would be a misstep. Uh, And I think the poem really encourages us to think about purity. Pure in heart, Uh, what does that mean? Is Larry pure in heart before he's bitten? Is anyone? And the sense of the werewolf's dual identity, I mean, this comes up later on in the movie when Sir John talks about how there's... Now, you ask me if I believe a man can become a wolf. If you mean, can he take on the physical characteristics of an animal? No, it's fantastic. However, I do believe that most anything can happen to a man in his own mind. That's another trace. That's something that comes up in many earlier werewolf stories, that there is a duality in human nature, particularly not all werewolves are men, uh, but medieval werewolf stories really tend to have male werewolves, and so do many 20th century werewolf stories, and the idea of masculinity as a uh, a source of a dual identity, a source of a divided identity. We see that again suggested by Sir John when he's talking about the Talbot tradition of being undemonstrative. See, the tradition also insists that the Talbots be the stiff-necked, undemonstrative type, and frequently this has been carried to very unhappy extremes. Don't I know that? There's a sense built into these characters, built into 40s and uh, medieval and 2020, 2020, conceptions of masculinity that suggest a sense of of purity as an ideal that is completely unachievable and impossible. And that that's not only an aspect of masculinity, it's also an aspect of humanity. Even a man who's pure in heart can become a wolf. That suggests not just... I mean, that suggests that uh, becoming a wolf is a corruption of purity, but it also implicitly suggests that no one is pure at heart. That even a man who's pure in heart can become a wolf suggests that the kind of purity that uh, we're imagining is not a protection against a divided identity, against predatory behavior, against aggression and violence. And then, of course, the idea of uh, pure at heart leads to the idea of pure in flesh that the werewolf is a corruption or an impurity, and particularly when it is portrayed as a werewolf bite. So uh, there's a suggestion of infection. Larry has been bitten by something impure and become impure himself. And that's part of why silver is important in this werewolf story, particularly with its emphasis on purity, is because silver is symbolic of purity, and purity is what can contract is what can counteract the impurity suggested or symbolized by the werewolf. 
even a man who's pure in heart and says his prayers at night. The idea of uh, says his prayers at night is strange in this movie because there's some suggestion, there, there's a little trace of religious meaning in the movie, but it's quite perfunctory, really. Compare it again to uh, Frankenstein, where the religious overtones are, especially Bride of Frankenstein, where the religious overtones are omnipresent. In this movie, there isn't a lot of uh, religious symbolism, explicitly religious symbolism, but there is a sense of what constitutes a good man, a good person, and that's associated with religious practice. I'm for church. And we see that by the idea of saying their prayers at night, we see that by the idea of going to church, and Sir John explicitly connects that Belief in the hereafter is a very healthy counterbalance to all the conflicting doubts man is plagued with these days. Come on. We can also see how this says his prayers at night. The emphasis on night is a clever little... Uh, the poem places itself at night and, and without explicitly saying that night is when werewolves happen, it suggests the idea that night is either the time for prayers or the time for werewolves, and one is not going to be a protection from the other. Centrally, we have the idea of a man can become a wolf. This is another trace that we have. All through the werewolves course, I emphasized the way that there is ambiguity about the ontology of a werewolf. Is a werewolf a man who looks like a wolf, or a man who acts like a wolf, or a man who really becomes a wolf? In the medieval werewolf stories, this ambiguity doesn't really exist, but in modern ones it does. Is a werewolf some kind of creature who is not either a human or a wolf, but something else entirely. The werewolf is neither man nor wolf, but a satanic creature with the worst qualities of both. Or uh, Robert E. Howard, famous for Conan the, Bar Conan the Barbarian, wrote a werewolf story in the tw 1920s called Wolf's Head, where in his story, a werewolf isn't a man who becomes a wolf, it's a wolf who becomes a man. In The Wolfman, we're really clear that this is a man who can become a wolf. And it isn't a man who can act like a wolf, or feel like a wolf, or look like a wolf. It is a man who can become a wolf. Like, his, his character... His identity changes. And that's important because it's part of what is monstrous and horrible about a werewolf, is there are different kinds of horror, there are different kinds of monstrosity for I've been transformed into something uh, and now my outward self no longer represents who I perceive my inward self to be. And there is a different kind of horror to I've been transformed into something inside and out and have become something different. In one of the later werewolf stories with Larry Talbot, he talks about uh, being a murderer and the new love interest in that movie says, but you didn't, it was out of your control. You didn't mean to do it. And he says, no, I wanted to kill. He remembers not only doing the things, but wanting to, and he that is part of the horror for this universe, this version of a werewolf. The last thing about this werewolf poem to draw attention to are the two things that when does a man become a wolf? When the wolf blaine, when the wolf bane blooms and when the autumn moon is bright. The wolf bane is not an aspect of werewolf mythology that has really uh, taken root. Haha, <laughs> get it? because it's a plant, from this movie. Um, 
But it's important for this movie, I think, that wolfbane is a plant that cures werewolfism, that is an antidote to werewolfism, and the wolfbane blooms at the same time as the man can become a wolf. So it's again this emphasis of duality, this emphasis that the curse and its cure happen at the same time. Uh, Only when the solution to being a werewolf blooms do werewolves happen. It's again like the pentagram. The one way up is good and the other way up is evil. The other thing, of course, the last thing is the autumn moon is bright. Now, the notice that this is an emphasis on night. This is a minor emphasis on the moon, but it's also equally an emphasis on the time of year. In the werewolf stories of the Middle Ages, where the transformation is based on timing rather than based on an ointment or the application of a magic ring, uh, Sometimes it's a couple of days a week, sometimes it's every month, sometimes it's less. The How frequently the transformation happens is not standardized in the werewolf stories of the Middle Ages, even the ones that are based on timing. And here I think there's a suggestion in this poem, or an idea that uh, the transformation is seasonal rather than monthly when the autumn moon is bright. So there's a time of year. And what happens, by the way, why autumn? Autumn is associated with... uh, I mean, autumn is associated with spookiness because of Halloween, but that also isn't a coincidence that Halloween is is set in autumn because autumn is the time of year when it's both the harvest and the death of plants. It's again this duality in the season. It's a time when the natural world is apparently dying, or seems to be. When I say apparently, I don't mean people think it is. I mean the appearances of the outer wor- of the natural world are of decay and death. And uh, of course, it's a spooky time. And of course, that's when werewolves would happen. In later Universal Werewolf movies, this poem uh, is tweaked a little bit from when the autumn moon is bright to when the moon is full and bright. And that's when we really most compellingly, most memorably and most strongly get the association of the full moon with a werewolf. I want to talk a little bit about how this movie grounds itself in its sources. And this, yet again, is a trace of a medieval tradition showing up here. We start off opening a book and we read the history of werewolves. Of course, this book doesn't really exist. It was written specifically for, I mean, this Uh, Like the werewolf poem, this little excerpt is not an excerpt from an extant book. It was written as a prop for this movie, and the book doesn't really exist. But why is this in the movie in the first place? For the same reason that Disney fairy tale movies start with a fairy tale book, also a fraudulent or a, a prop fairy tale book, none of those Disney fairy tale books are opening fairy tales as written they're all props made for the movie. But it grounds the movie in a tradition that pre-exists the movie, and in fact, grounding a story in sources that are kind of hazy, that are kind of uh, fraudulent. This feels very medieval. And if you've read the medieval werewolf stories, you'll know so many of them start by saying, I know that this is true, here are my sources, and the sources that they cite are either inaccurate or uh, unverifiable, and the tradition of doing that is the same, I mean, there's lots of reasons for it, including the same reason why other monster stories like Dracula and Frankenstein also start by citing sources by 
giving documents to show that the story they're telling is true, even though we know that it isn't, even though the movie going public is not going to be tricked into thinking that this is a documentary and that's not what they're trying to do, but they still present it as being grounded in sources. And Kurt Siodmak, writer of the movie, talked in interviews about doing all this research, about grounding his movie in pre-existing folklore. All of that is aids in the suspension of disbelief, aids in allowing us to experience the story uh, while pretending to believe that it's true or based on something true or allowing it to affect us emotionally as if it was true. And it also is tradition for these kinds of supernatural uh, horror monster stories for all the same reasons. There's ambiguity uh, that that allows for the reader, for the writer, for the movie. We can pretend to believe that it's true at the very same time as we retain our sophisticated knowledge that, of course, werewolves aren't real. That brings us a bit to the use of ambiguity in this movie. There's a lot in this movie coupled with the sense of inevitability. We know how the movie is going to end. We know where it's going. Uh, But a lot of the movie revolves around asking questions about the truth of things that we, the viewers, know to be true. So, is there really a werewolf? We know that there is, but we spend a lot of the movie with characters wondering whether there is. Is Larry Talbot really transforming into a werewolf? We know that he is, but we spend a lot of the movie wondering whether he is. Why does everyone insist that I'm confused? This, a lot of this is a palimpsest. A lot of this is a leftover trace of an earlier draft of the movie in which there was more uh, extreme ambiguity. Kurt Siodmak's original script for this movie involved the main character named Larry Gill instead of Larry Talbot. That is not important, but what is important is Larry Gill would never have transformed into a werewolf on screen. We would never have seen Larry Gill as a werewolf, and all the movie was going to be ambiguous, where is Larry turning into a wolf in his body, or is he mentally ill and merely hallucinating or believes that he is transforming into a wolf and the movie was going to never actually answer the question and in the movie that we see although we the audience see larry walking around as a wolf and his body changing so there's less ambiguity than in that original script there is still some ambiguity in that uh Everyone treats, um, ambiguity may be the wrong word, but we're playing up the uh, instability of reality because everyone treats Larry like he's confused, like he's insane. And it adds to this sense, both of inevitability and of pathos, that Larry knows what's real, but also can't believe it, can't convince anyone of it. You don't understand. You think I'm insane. Why... We see him actually doubting his sanity, and the horror, I mean, it's a real question. I think it is hard to decide, because there's a different kind of horror in both ways, but is there greater horror in him not knowing and us also not knowing, or in us knowing what's true, but neither he nor anyone else uh, believing that it's true? I don't know. The Sir John... The skeptic who doubts, who doesn't believe that it's a werewolf, who believes that his son is mentally ill, who ties him to a chair to prove to him that he's not a werewolf. This is a example. It's not the uh, first example, but it's an example of these kinds of skeptical characters in supernatural movies where, and, and books, where we are as the audience are encouraged to think of them as so closed-minded and uh, stupid for not believing what's obvious in front of us, when, as again the DVD commentary to this movie points out, he's the most realistic character in the movie. If this was happening to you, 
you would behave, maybe you might not tie your son to a chair, but you would behave like he does in that you would not believe that your son had been transformed magically into a wolf. You would believe that he was mentally ill. Uh, so it's this, again, this ambiguity where we are placed in a position to um, judge as being implausibly closed-minded the character who behaves most like most of us are most likely to behave. I want to talk very quickly about the idea of outsiders in The Wolfman, because there's an important aspect through the movie of how the movie treats outsiders and how the movie literalizes the sense of being an outsider outside the community, outside uh, how that can be alienating and uh, feel monstrous. That Larry is an outsider, despite the fact that he is Larry Talbot, and this is Talbot Castle. He's been away for 18 years. He has the mannerisms and the worldview of an American in a non-American world. And he doesn't know the folklore and the traditions and the customs, and even the local people. He's an outsider, and yet he also was an outsider in America because this is his home where he grew up. Welcome home, Larry. I'm mighty glad to be here, Father. And the sense that he is such an outsider in his own home, in his own family, with his own father, he is more of an outsider because he should belong than he would be if he was just an American unconnected to the family. Which, by the way, is what Larry Gill, the uh, original character in the first script was, was just a random American. But making him part of the family and yet not part of the family actually strengthens the sense of him as an outsider because he's not at home anywhere. He can't go away from this castle and feel at home either because this is what his home is and yet he's an outsider to it. And that also is why we see him being uh, trying to initiate a romantic relationship with a woman who is engaged. By the way, as a further tangent, the sense of Gwen as an unfaithful woman is also a trace of medieval werewolf stories. She's not an antagonist here, but it's the fact that she is engaged and yet going out on a date and kissing a man who she's not engaged with not engaged to, that would be read as as a scandal. And the characters in the story treat it as a scandal. So she's uh, a trace of this unfaithful woman in werewolf stories. And she also, the fact that he his romantic interest is already engaged to someone else makes him an outsider. He's a third wheel. And on the date that he takes with her, that he goes on with Gwen, uh, he, she invites Jenny along so he's again a third wheel. Uh, possibly Jenny's the third wheel, but Jenny and Gwen are going to the uh, fortune teller and Larry kind of joins them. He's the outsider there. And then when he comes into church and everyone looks at him and shuns him because they think that he has murdered Bela the, were the gypsy and he has to leave, again visualizing this sense of him as an outsider. If we're going to talk about outsiders, I just said Bela the Gypsy, and I hope that you shuddered at that just as much as I did. I'm using the word because the movie did, but that is a racist slur, um, and it is used in the movie. I mean, these characters, the I'm going to keep using it because the movie does and because I think that uh, there is a real disconnect between although it still has real-world harm, there's a real disconnect between the uh, real-world Romani and the gypsies of this movie. Those are not, they're not the same thing. Although the connection between them does real harm to real people. But the perceived connection between them does real harm to real people. But the gypsies in this movie uh, are outsiders, and gypsies are used as a shorthand for outsider in this movie. And in kind of all discourse of gypsies 
all the othering language around gypsies. Why that is a slur is because it's used as othering language to say that they're outsiders, perpetual outsiders. And why Bela is the werewolf in this movie is again because werewolves are outsiders. And we see this, that the characters literally walk away from the town, out into the camp, out into the woods. They go outside to find the gypsy who is a werewolf who then makes the other outsider a werewolf and the only person who will believe that Larry really is a werewolf is Maleva played by Maria Uspenskaya as I said uh wonderfully but she represents outsiders and we see that again her and the priest and the priest when they're burying Bela being like I hear your people are coming to town dance. Why can't you people do like normal people do? And she says, For a thousand years, we gypsies have buried our dead like that. I couldn't break the custom even if I wanted to. Well, this is our tradition and I couldn't change it if I wanted to. And that underscores their outsider status. Because this is a movie about an insider becoming an outsider, or an outsider becoming an insider, and about the ambiguity of place. Which, by the way, I'm not going to go into it, but ambiguity of place is another kind of ambiguity in this movie. A lot of write-ups of this movie say that it is set in Wales, but it's not. There's no mention of Wales in the entire movie. It's set in some ambiguous other place. Uh, apparently not America although a lot of the characters have American accents. But an earlier script set it in Wales, and some of the sequels talk about Cardiff Hospital, but there's no mention of Wales or Welsh anywhere in the movie proper. I could say lots more and would like to. I'm aware of how this movie, how the time is running by on this class, so I'm just going to quickly mention two little more things. One is that one of the most effective things about The Wolfman is the atmosphere. And I'm just going to draw attention to the use of the woods, which is yet another trace of medieval werewolf folklore and stories. The werewolf is always in the woods because the wolf represents wildness as a contrast to civilization. So he is human in town, and he goes into the woods to be a wolf, and all of his wolfishness happens in the woods, because that's where wolfishness belongs, and that's what wolfishness does for him, is pull him away from community and civilization. If you have more to say about the wolfman, or questions about it, or would just like to talk about it, you can send me questions or thoughts or insights, paul at clockworksacademy.com, or you can find me on Twitter, at Dr. Moffat, and I would be happy to talk over the Wolfman with you in more depth, in more detail, or just in less depth with superficial factoids. Like the fact that the makeup artist for this movie, Jack Pierce, is the same makeup artist as Frankenstein. That's neat. I don't have a lot of depth to that, but that's just a fact about this movie that's cool. If you would like lots more about werewolves and werewolf theory and monster theory and the medieval werewolf stories that I've been talking about through this whole class, you can take the werewolves course from Clockworks Academy. You can find that at clockworksacademy.com. Depending on when you are listening to this, it could be starting very soon or it could be starting in a couple months, but it will be starting again. That will be taught by me. It is an eight week course with a lot more depth and uh, it is a lot of fun and I hope you will consider joining us. Find out more about that at clockworksacademy.com. I have been Dr. Paul Moffat. Thank you for joining me. Goodbye.